Hi, I'm Isabella Gross Alström. I'm a backend developer from Stockholm, Sweden, and I will be speaking about acceptance factors and the death of the wife acceptance factor. So, Wikipedia says that wife acceptance factor is an assessment of design elements that either increase or diminish the likelihood a wife will approve of the purchase of expensive consumer electronics products, such as high fidelity loudspeakers, home theater systems, and personal computers. Stylish, compact forms and appealing colors are commonly considered to have a high wife acceptance factor. The term is a tongue in cheek play on electronics jargon such as form factor or power factor and derives from the idea that men are predisposed to appreciate gadgetry and performance criteria, whereas women would be wooed by visual and aesthetic factors. It's really just another way of saying, will my fussy tech ignorant wife who couldn't possibly share my appreciation for high end gear be happy to let this into our home? Louis Lipnick coined this expression in the 1950s and Larry Greenhill popularized it in the 1986 issue of Stereophile magazine. Lipnick's wife, actress Lynn Jane Foreman, coined MIF, or marriage interference factor, adding that audiophile husbands should balance their large and ugly electronic acquisitions with gifts to the wife made on the basis of similar experience, expense. Today, 70 years later, this expression is still in use in many areas of tech, amongst others in our community of home automation. Some of you might want to say, come on, it's just a way to be funny. Well, here's a few jokes in the same subject, but at no one's expense. Instead of, I've published a 3D printable enclosure on Thingiverse for that all important wife acceptance factor. Try saying, I've published an enclosure on Thingiverse so that your DIY motor doesn't look but as ugly next to your precious imported Venetian blinds. Others might want to point out that some women also use these terms or think they're funny. Yes, that might be, just like Nipnik's wife agreed with and expanded his expression. But the expression was coined in the same area, era as, for example, these ads. Is this really the views we want to perpetuate? I'll let you have a moment to look at these. So I was going to add in a piece here on my personal history about how it is to be a woman in the tech industry with typical manly interests like computers, games, and well, home automation. But you know what? I think you get it anyway. I think everyone deep down understands that a lot of women think answering a question like, what kind of robot vacuum cleaner should I get with, I don't need one, I have a wife, is not very funny. Or how about simply the answer my wife to the question, what are your favorite automations at home? This is not to say acceptance factors doesn't matter. They absolutely do to everyone, and not just you and your spouse, but also the rest of the family. Do you have children or pets? Do guests come over? When most people say wife acceptance factor, what I think they really mean is a sort of an undefined framework for what is acceptable home automation when living with other people. It just happens to be offensively named by some dude in the 50s. When your automation or device is good for the acceptance or approval factor, that means it's scoring high on this framework. The intention is very good, but the name ruins it by enforcing incorrect stereotypes about gender-related interests and partnerships. Plus, it's simply far too limiting in its scope. Think of it more as a UX user experience for your home. First, you need to figure out what your intended users are. First, we have the most important ones, your family. These are your daily core users. 
The use and need a lot of features and consistent uptime is key. They can often get used to kind of weird or unfinished interfaces as long as they're consistent. They also need to feel safe and maintain a sense of privacy. Then we have guests. They are occasional users and need only a few features like turning on and off lights. Those features need to work at all times and have intuitive interfaces. Which interfaces are needed depends on your guests. Your grandmother might not be used to speaking to a voice assistant and the house sitter that comes when you're on vacation can't suddenly be plunged into darkness because the motion activated lights are on too short of a timer. Then comes a group of people that is very important and not often thought about, first responders. An EMT that comes into your home to save your life must not be hindered by not being able to turn your lights on. And maybe you have pets. Does the robot vacuum cleaner scare the cat or maybe you should only run it when someone's home? Or does the dog trip the motion sensors and therefore set off the alarm and scare you half to death? This can actually be a good thing to check for the robot vacuum cleaner too. And uh, what happens, uh, what about how the house works? Do you have an away mode? What happens when it's activated? Do your automations waste energy or water? Could a malfunction damage the property? And in that case, do you have security in place for that? Like perhaps leak detection for your automatic watering of the house plants? And last but not least, yourself. Do you like the overall product and design of the system? Do your automations help or hinder your life? Do they relieve stress or cause it? Obviously, you can never make a foolproof system that makes sense to everyone and is always working. But there are a few things that can maximize the chance of approval. If you don't live alone, Talk to your family or others you live with. What do they want? Do they have any ideas of their own that you can implement? Do they agree that it would be awesome to do this new cool thing you read about in the forums? If they're hesitant, could you maybe agree to make a trial period to see if it works for all of you? And if you live alone, think of possible guests. Have a testing strategy or even maybe a development environment if you're really serious about things. You want to try out a new automation? Perhaps do the logic but send yourself a notification instead of sounding a really high siren when your alarm gets triggered. Maybe there's a fault in the logic and your child comes home, the system doesn't see it and they trigger the alarm without knowing how to turn it off. Try it out like that for a normal week or so to find common mistakes. You want to uh, try out a new cool theme for Loveless, perhaps, uh, but it happens to break the main view, and now you have to go to bed. Try it on a secondary view that's not used too often, or make a copy of your main view to try things on. Always make sure that the basic functions of your home is intact. Don't put all your trust in this new cloud-based thing, for example. When the servers go down and you can't get the water heater to work, no one will be happy. You can do this with the help uh, of these principle. principles. First, we have the principle of least astonishment. It's often used in software development and it can be used to describe what makes a good user experience. No one should be surprised by how your lights work. The clapper, was a cute way to turn, out, turn on your lights, but it wasn't very intuitive. A component of a system should behave in a way that most users will expect it to behave. When designing automations, I like to think about a hypothetical neighbor who's coming over to feed my cats when I'm on vacation. They know nothing about voice commands and don't have the Home Assistant Companion app on their phone. If they need to turn out on the lights, what would be the least surprising way to make that happen? Either the lights come on automatically or they'd use the light switch. So I installed smart light switches that turn on the lights. The next principle is the lowest common denominator. 
use this to determine what automations to prioritize in order to maximize acceptance. What features do all of your users need? Make sure those automations are absolutely foolproof. Turning on lights, getting Netflix up on your TV or turning on the AC or heater, not waking them up at your automatic 7 a.m. morning workout playlists, etc. I think we've all done the presence detection, think you're coming home in the middle of the night and turning on all the lights mistake, or maybe the opposite, thinking you've left and turned everything off while you're awake. How do we manage this in the real world then? Well, this is gonna be highly dependent on your personal setup. I already gave you the example of using notifications to show you when certain automations would run before implementing them for real. You can also use, for example, input booleans to decide when to turn on or off certain groups of automations for, say, a guest mode to make your home more guest friendly. You can use these as conditions in your automations. Also, always have a failsafe so that you know how to turn off an automation that has gone haywire. And remember, always do a backup and read the breaking changes before updating. So that's, uh, that's it for me this evening. Thank you for listening to me. I will be in the Q&A section uh, after this.